The life of Daredevil is a life of violence. But can violence save the world if it destroys the soul in the process? There are many different issues addressed throughout the first season of the Netflix Daredevil series, not the least of which being institutional corruption, the power or lack thereof of the criminal justice system, and the nature of heroism. But these are all filtered through the spiritual and psychological journey of Matt Murdock, and his quest to become someone who can make a difference within a corrupt and oppressive system. Through its brutally choreographed fight scenes, its dueling characters of Murdoch and Wilson Fisk, and its contemplation of what actions must be taken to stop evil, Marvel's Daredevil asks us to contemplate the spiritual effects of violence, and whether taking a life is ever justified. Daredevil Season 1 introduces us to Matt Murdock, Karen Page, Foggy Nelson, and Ben Urich. Four people looking to make a difference in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood of Manhattan, only to quickly stumble upon a far-reaching conspiracy to control New York. It all leads back to Wilson Fisk, a mysterious, powerful man quietly pulling the strings and willing to eliminate anyone that stands in the way of his efforts to supposedly clean up the city. Over the course of 13 episodes, each of these characters fight back in their own ways. But it's Matt Murdock whose soul is ultimately tested and judged played by Charlie Cox, who gives an incredible performance with his eyes almost always obscured in some form. Murdoch becomes a vigilante who makes a difference in New York through shockingly brutal violence. Showrunner Stephen DeKnight's approach to Daredevil is equal parts Frank Miller's original run, Brian Michael Bendis's Daredevil, Miller's The Man Without Fear, and films like Dog Day Afternoon and The French Connection. Dark superheroics meets even darker 70s crime films. When Daredevil premiered on April 10th, 2015, it quickly gained notoriety outside of its typical comic book audience because of its action choreography. In particular, the single-take hallway fight that caps off Episode 2. And while these action sequences are impressive when simply taken on their own, their content and structure speak to something larger. The fights of Daredevil are protracted. They're bathed in sickly yellows, greens, and reds. They forego the typical slam-bang choreography of most superhero TV shows and movies in favor of something bloodier and more brutal. You can easily imagine a Daredevil fight scene done in the style of a comic book. Billy clubs bouncing around the room, supercharged kicks that destroy petty criminals in a single shot. Daredevil swinging across buildings without a second thought. Instead, what we get is this. Even a petty crook takes multiple hits to stay down and our hero, a seemingly righteous man, needs to pummel his enemies over and over again until they stop fighting. The mashing of flesh and bone with a deliberate desire to injure forces both hero and audience to consider the gruesome nature of what's happening. Violence in real life isn't pretty. It isn't carried out with aesthetically pleasing sensibilities. It's disgusting. It's an intentional act of bodily destruction, a physical manifestation of rage, of hate, of dehumanization. If Matt Murdock were dispassionate in his violence and efficient in his attacks, then his fights would be easier to digest. Instead, DeKnight, stunt coordinator Philip Silvera, and executive producer Drew Goddard make us sit within deliberate acts of violence. We're also frequently forced to witness the aftermath, usually through the body of Matt Murdock. There are multiple times where Matt is brutally injured and near death. He recovers thanks to the help of Claire Temple, but Matt's physical punishment is almost a form of penance for his sins. Lying bleeding and broken, he's forced to contemplate the vigilante life he's now living, and we as viewers have to consider it as well. This is a violent life, one that is both physically and spiritually punishing. Superhero stories often provide audiences with some form of wish fulfillment, but I couldn't think of why anyone would actually want to be the Matt Murdock of this Netflix series. He's a deeply angry individual, angry at the injustices of the world, angry that his sight was taken from him, angry that his father was murdered, angry that the one man that understood his gift abandoned him without a second thought. Being a vigilante lets him channel the anger into violence that has some sort of morally ambiguous excuse. I need you to know why I'm hurting you. It's not just the boy. I'm doing this because I enjoy it. <laughs> that anger is even personified in how the show depicts his heightened awareness of the world. It's a world on fire. 
When discussing the everyday reality of anger, Martha C. Nussbaum, professor of law and ethics at the University of Chicago, said, Anger greets most of us every day. Anger is both poisonous and popular. Even when people acknowledge its destructive tendencies, they still so often cling to it, seeing it as a strong emotion, connected to self-respect and manliness, or, for women, to the vindication of equality. Maybe you're being called to summon the better angels of your nature. Maybe that's the struggle you're feeling deep within you. And how do you know the angels and the devil inside me aren't the same thing? Confronting the violence in Daredevil means contending with violence in the real world, as well as the anger that we have within ourselves. We can blame many things for our anger, but whatever the case may be, we have to accept its presence inside us and choose how we channel it. Will you let rage consume you, or will you hone it into something that makes a positive difference in the world? Will Matt Murdock become a murderer when all other options fail? Or will he hold the very thin line that keeps him on a more sanctified side of heroism? He's already dangerously close to crossing that line early in the series. I just don't think I can let myself fall in love with someone who's so damn close to becoming what he hates. The book of James chapter 1 verses 19 through 20 states, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Murdoch is Catholic, and it's his Catholicism that forces him to reckon with his own violent nature, so it's no doubt that these verses regarding anger play into his deeply personal trials. These are words to remember when the injustices of the world spark anger within us. But what happens when the anger has been inside for a long, long time? That's Matt Murdock at the very start of Daredevil. He's been angry for years. Maybe he didn't realize it before, but it's all coming to the surface now. His father was angry. His father was murdered. Now Matt is angry. And maybe Matt will murder. He acknowledges this internal hellfire in confessional with his priest, Father Lantham, in the very first episode. My grandmother, she was the real Catholic. Fear of God ran deep, you'd have liked her. She used to say, be careful of the Murdoch boys. They got the devil in them. The Bible asks for the followers of God to pursue peace and wait for God's judgment to bring justice. But where is God in a city filled with crime, controlled by men who willingly pursue evil for their own gain, littered with innocent bodies? God's judgment is carried out through those that seek to have his will enacted on the earth. For Matt Murdock, this means a life of violence, but a violence that does not kill. When the limits of religion are found, philosophy seeks to make sense of the world, to give form to complex ideas and the chaotic emotions and thoughts of people by studying values, reason, knowledge, language, and existence itself. Philosophical theories can bring peace to someone's life by providing a better understanding of the world. Violence is the opposite of the peace sought through philosophy. It doesn't seek to understand, but instead to erase. Violence shatters the senses. It renders life senseless, and senseless lives create further violence. When the world becomes twisted, when evil men distort the rules that seem to be the only thing that separates society from pure chaos, there's an impulse to use our fists to punch the world back into a shape that makes sense. At the start of the season, Matt Murdock believes that the facts of wrong and right dictated by the law provide some semblance of sanity within the courtroom. Even if people try to bend the rules through power, murder, and money, the system remains pure. What was in my client's heart when he took Mr. Prohaska's life, whether he is a good man or something else entirely, is irrelevant. These questions of good and evil, as important as they are, have no place in a court of law. Fisk, played by Vincent D'Onofrio, challenges Murdoch's worldview because his power overthrows that system and also renders Matt's vigilante efforts impotent. Fisk is lethal. Fisk is corrupt. Murdoch's efforts as both attorney and vigilante seem like half measures because he refuses to kill or bend the law. But the truth is that both men see themselves as doing what is necessary to make a difference in the world. What sets them apart is that Fisk believes he's justified in his actions. Whereas Matt's guilty conscience drives him to question his motivations. If we're not seeking to question our means of violence, and instead to excuse them, then we become like Wilson Fisk, a man who believes his violent acts are for the greater good. I've hurt people, and I'm going to hurt more. It's impossible to avoid for what I'm trying to do. But I take no pleasure in it. 
Philosopher Albert Camus once said, The role of the intellectual cannot be to excuse the violence of one side and condemn that of the other. But there is a difference in how Murdoch and Fisk employ violence. Murdoch is working past being the aggressor and instead becoming a defender, using his fists to protect the weak in a broken system, instead of purely expressing his anger in some self-justified manner. To quote theologian Henry Nouwen, Much violence is based on the illusion that life is a property to be defended and not to be shared. And that is Fisk's reason behind violence. What is violence but the ultimate imposition of one's will upon the physical being of another? I am emotionally hurt by you. I physically hurt you, which in turn leads to emotional injury. A person stands in opposition to my idea. I beat on them until they give way. Someone's existence prevents me from living in the way I want. I kill them so my life can take the shape I desire. I'm not seeking penance for what I've done, Father. I'm asking forgiveness for what I'm about to do. Matt's Catholicism plays a vital role in his duality regarding vigilante violence. He is both called to use the gifts that he has to protect the city and also convicted of his violent actions. What does the Bible say about violence? It's more complicated than you may think. In Genesis 9-6, the Bible clearly lays out the cycle of violence. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. You don't need to believe in anything to see that violence creating more violence is a very real consequence. But it's a consequence that isn't always addressed in superhero stories. In Psalm 11.5, David writes, The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. In the New Testament, Christ calls his followers to peace, and the Old Testament characterizes murder as the first great evil, the outgrowth of Adam and Eve's fall, but God is also violent in his wrath. In Psalm 55.15, David prays to God, Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the realm of the dead for evil finds lodging among them. This may be a wish for some divine intervention that keeps the king's hands clean, but David later writes in Psalm 144.1, Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. That's not simply an Old Testament view. In Romans 13.4, the Apostle Paul writes, For the one in authority is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. There is a justification of some type of violence in these words. A deadly judgment lived out through individuals that Paul ascribes to God's will. If these words should only be applied to those in positions of governance, Daredevil shows that widespread corruption of the police and government force others like Matt Murdock to take up the role of agent of wrath. As George Orwell said, People sleep peaceably in their beds at night only because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. Daredevil is that rough man. Throughout the first season, Matt and his allies try to stop Fisk through non-violent means, and then by non-fatal yet violent means. They fail each time, and the question of whether Matt should kill Fisk becomes an increasingly prominent aspect of the season. What can stop a man completely willing to kill and commit acts of evil besides death? Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is the righteous man who gives way before the wicked. Proverbs 25 something, I never can remember. Meaning righteous men have a duty to stand up to evil. One interpretation. Another is that when the righteous succumb to sin, it is as harmful as if the public well were poisoned. By episode nine, Matt decides to kill him, spurred on by Fisk's murder of an innocent woman. Instead, he is almost killed in a battle with Nobu and then beaten near death by Fisk. In the final few episodes, Matt and Fisk complete their journeys of self-discovery. Two men whose early lives were shaped by violence. Matt by the murder of his father, Fisk's by murdering his father, now live lives centered on violence. Matt's duty is to find the gray line between the rules of the courtroom and the anarchy of reality and stay within it to bring about justice. Rejecting murder and instead embracing gifts that can stop evil men from harming more people transforms self-destructive anger into a positive force for good. I know how you feel about what I do, Foggy. This is the part where law meets reality. Regarding the role that anger takes in influencing our actions, Professor Nussbaum said, a wronged person who is really angry, seeking to strike back, soon arrives at a fork in the road. Three paths lie before her. Path 1. She goes down the path of status focus, seeing the event as all about her and her rank. 
Path 2. She focuses on the original offense and seeks payback, imagining that the offender's suffering would actually make things better. Path 3. She can turn to the future and focus on doing whatever would make sense in the situation and be really helpful. This may well include the punishment of the wrongdoer, but in a spirit that is deterrent rather than retaliatory. Fisk, who once believed himself to be a type of self-justified savior, accepts that he is evil. Mark 7, 20-23 says, What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Fisk may love Vanessa, who shows him kindness that he's never experienced before, but his actions all stem from a murderous heart. Matt's journey has been to reject hatred, which leads to murderous desires, and instead accept a more righteous calling to protect those who are victimized by people like Fisk. If the parable of the Good Samaritan illustrates Matt to be the good man that saves the innocent, then Fisk is something else entirely. I am the ill intent who set upon the traveler on a road that he should not have been on. Fisk is exposed and arrested because Murdoch reunites with and trusts Foggy and Karen, who use the system to finally bring his crimes to light. But Fisk's corruption gives him the chance to escape. This is the chance for Daredevil to bring about justice through violence, but not as an expression of his internalized rage, but as a tool to stop corruption. By stopping but not killing Fisk, Daredevil saves his own soul. He made each and every one of us with a purpose, to me, a reason for being. I believe so, yes. Then why did he put the devil in me? That's the question in the journey of Daredevil. Why did Matt gain these senses? Why does he have this burning rage inside him? Maybe this violence personified within Matt, who has to live with a turmoil that he can never get rid of, is the chance for us to see a more righteous path in our own lives. Maybe that was God's plan all along. Why he created him. Allowed him to fall from grace. To become a symbol to be feared. Warning to us all, to tread the path of the righteous. Violence isn't right. Violence can't bring back the people we've lost. Justice may be able to prevent others from experiencing what we have, but it's impossible to tip the scales back to where they used to be. But should we simply let the men who exploit and abuse the innocent run free for the sake of our own purity? That might be the greatest evil. Matt's journey to becoming Daredevil, a man of violence but a man fighting for good, is a path of finding contradictory balance within the soul. The path to becoming an embodiment of all our rage and violence and good and evil. A demonic angel, a sanctified devil, and a dark reflection of us all.